Hey there, drone fans. Rick here again from Drone Valley. In today's clip, I'd like to discuss the new rules that were just proposed by the FAA for the remote identification of unmanned aerial vehicles, or what we normally refer to as drones. Now, the document number is NPRM-2019-1100, and I have a link below where you can go and read that for yourself, and I recommend you do that, because if the rules are put in place the way these have been proposed, it's going to fundamentally change the way you register your drone and the way you fly your drone. So if you're out there flying drones today, it's definitely going to affect you. And I'm going to break this clip into four different sections. I'm going to talk about why they're doing this, what are they doing specifically, how does it affect us, and then finally I'll come back with a conclusion to give you a couple of ideas of maybe what you can do to help this community stand up and speak with one voice, because I'm going to sound dramatic here, but if these rules are put in place the way they've been proposed, it's going to create havoc in the industry. It's going to create a problem for hobby flyers. It's going to fundamentally change where you can fly, how far you can fly, and there's a ton of stuff in there that scares me about personal liberty. So I'm going to make this clip as short as possible to give you just the basics, but I promise you I've been studying this document for the last couple of weeks, and there's a lot of angles to this, and it would be impossible for me to discuss them all in one clip. So expect me to have a series of clips being released that talk about various aspects of it, as well as alternatives that would work really well that could be implemented today that wouldn't be as intrusive and as burdensome as this proposal is, because reading through it, we had a pretty good place where we were flying. This rule changes everything to lock down our ability to fly. And in most cases, it's going to prevent a lot of hobbyists from even putting a drone up in the air. So stay tuned for those clips later on. But for today's clip, I'm going to basically break it into those four sections I talked about. And the first section has to do with why are they doing this? And it should be pretty obvious that drones have become incredibly popular. People are putting drones up all the time, and they're, some of them understand the rules, some of them are registered, and some aren't. So it's a bit of a wild west out there, and I have to say out of the gate that I'm actually a fan, and I support remote identification of UAVs. I think it's a good thing for the hobby. I don't think it's that burdensome to actually register your drone and be able to identify the drone that's up in the air. Now, to the extent that they're pushing it, I think is way too much. It's going way too deep. But I really feel like if you're a responsible flyer, like most of us are, just like with your car or your boat or whatever you happen to register, your dog, you register it. And if you do something bad with it, it makes it easy for the authorities to understand that that car that hit my car and then took off in a sort of hit and run, it'd be easy to find out that that guy was driving that car. So I think that's a responsible thing to do. What worries me about this new regulation is that it goes much deeper than that. And I'll get into that in the next section. So I think there are two reasons they're doing this. The first has to do with security, personal responsibility. They want to know what drones are up in the air. And if you're at a nuclear power plant or a prison, it would be a good thing for you to know that, hey, there's a drone approaching the gate. Maybe I should know who's flying that drone. So I think remote identification is a really good thing. So the first reason they're doing it is for security in the air. They want to know what's up there. The second reason, which is really where I have a problem, is around the commercial intrusion, I'll call it, of all these other big companies that want to put drones up to deliver packages. Now, I'm not against that completely because I feel like drones are a wonderful way to get something from point A to point B as long as it's done sensibly and it doesn't affect the hobby. Because honestly, we were up there first. All these commercial interests that are going to get up there and start flying drones came later, right? So it's kind of our skies right now. So there are ways to sort of incorporate those into the national airspace that doesn't dramatically affect hobbyists. But those are fundamentally the two reasons this rule is coming out. Number one, because they need to know who's up in the air, and I think that's a good thing. And number two, the commercial interests want to integrate their drones up into the airspace, and I think that's a good thing too. If you're delivering blood, or you're delivering organs, or you're, you're rescuing kids out in the woods, commercial flights are definitely something that should be supported. But I feel like as a community, we can certainly come together over a cup of coffee and figure all this stuff out. So those are the two reasons they're doing it. Now, if you stay tuned to this next section, I'm going to talk specifically about what they're doing. And this is the part that you're going to get your blood pressure raised over. So definitely pay attention to this next section. Now that you know why the FAA is suggesting these changes, it's really important to understand how it affects the hobby and more specifically, how it's going to impact you as a flyer. Because these changes that are suggested in this NPRM are not small things. They're major changes to the way you fly your quad. And without sounding dramatic, it's almost like we hit a pivot point in our hobby where up till yesterday, we all understood what we could do with our quads, where we could fly, and the rules that the FAA put out, I think were really common sense. They were easy to follow, they kept everybody safe, and they let us enjoy our hobby with a lot of onerous oversight from the federal government. These new regulations, if they become law, are gonna change all of that. So they're gonna determine where you can fly, how far you can fly, 
what kind of quads you can fly, and even if you can fly the quads you already own. But more importantly, I feel that they're really intrusive into my flying behavior. So there's gonna be tracking going on when you're flying your quad that's gonna be kept for an unspecified period of time. We're not sure who gets to review that data or what that data is gonna be used for. So there's a lot of unknowns in this regulation that need to be nailed down. And what I find so interesting is that if you read through the proposal, and I've done it a bunch of times, it's a couple of hours of reading, there's so much gray area in there that hasn't been defined yet that it's scary the possibilities of where that can go. And I'm not one of those conspiracy theory guys, but I like to know what I'm getting into before I sign up for it. So essentially what this proposal outlines is three different things. The first part, which they've clearly defined, is the responsibility of the hobbyist. So two things change for us. The first one is the registration process, and I'll go through that in a minute. So they're asking for a little bit more data there. They've also changed the way you register your quads. But the second part of that, based on the hobbyist involvement, is around the kind of quad we can fly. And they've defined three different categories of flight. And honestly, none of the quads we have today meet any of those three categories. They meet one of them, but it's gonna really restrict the way you fly. So I'll go through the three categories, but the parts that scare me are the data they're gonna collect on us when we're flying, hasn't really been defined yet. They haven't defined who's gonna collect it, how long it's gonna be kept, who gets to look at it. And as a citizen of the US, I like to be assumed innocent <laughs> until I'm proven guilty. So if I'm flying reasonably, oh, you could say, Rick, don't worry about it. They're just gonna keep the data. I just don't like people having access to data knowing where I flew, where I was standing when I flew, how long I flew, how far I flew, how many times I was in that field. That kind of data for me is something you would investigate you know, if I was a bad guy or doing something bad, I just don't like the fact that they're gonna track me every time I put a, a quad aloft and keep that data for an unspecified period of time. They also haven't determined who gets to collect that data, what kind of personally identify information is gonna be in there, how they're gonna correlate that with the registration process. So there's a lot of unknowns there. And then the third thing, which is again, an unspecified feature of this particular proposal, is what the manufacturers have to do to build new quads to accommodate these three categories of flight that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. So what scares me about that is that we've all invested a lot of money in our, in our toys, in the hobby, how do I know that my Mavic 2 can be updated to meet these new requirements? Do I have to get rid of that and buy a Mavic 3 or a Mavic 4 that's got all this new feature set built into it? So there's a cost involved, not only with replacing gear to adhere to these new categories, but more importantly, I'm also not a fan of spending extra money where I've got to have an internet connection. You know, every time I fly, that's going to be a data plan that I've got to pay for. A lot of people can't afford that. So does that mean only people that are wealthy can fly and people that maybe aren't as well off can't fly. I don't think that's a very democratic way to approach it. So I'm rambling a little bit here, but I'm, I'm trying to be as contained as I can about this because reading through it, it's clear to me that this is all about assuming everybody's a bad guy and making it easier to find the bad guys. Whereas I'd rather take the other approach and assume everybody's a good guy and put technologies in place to sort of catch the bad guys. So I'll talk about it at the end. So let's get into the regulations first and then I'll talk more about the conclusions. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the new registration process because two fundamental things change there and I wanna make sure you understand what happens there. So I'll get into that next. Under this new FAA proposal, you'll need to register each one of your drones individually and you'll receive a certificate of aircraft registration for each of the quads you register. Also, as part of this new registration process, you'll need to supply the serial number of the drone as well as a phone number of the owner of that drone. The other major change in this proposal, which I'm not at all comfortable with, is the way that your drone is going to have to remotely identify itself to interested parties. Now I use the air quotes for a reason because they don't clearly define in the proposal who those interested parties are. Now I'm assuming, which is always a dangerous thing, that it's limited to law enforcement officials, state and local government, federal agencies, park police, or even security people at a facility that wanna know who's flying that drone. And they have the right and the ability to determine who's flying it, is it registered, and also where's the pilot standing? So let's imagine for a second, you're working at a nuclear power plant, your security, and you see a drone heading over the fence, probably a good idea for you to identify who's flying it and go find the guy and have a conversation with him about how this is protected airspace and you shouldn't be flying the drone here. So I have no problem with the fact that they can identify it, know that it's registered and know that I'm flying it because I'm playing by the rules. So if I'm flying in a place that I should be flying, no one's gonna hassle me. But if I'm a goofball and decide to launch my drone over the fence in a military facility, bad things are gonna happen. And I think the whole point of remote ID is to give the authorities the ability to identify a good drone from a bad drone and then take action against that. My worry with this though, is that if I'm broadcasting that, and I'll get into the three categories in a minute, but if I'm broadcasting that information, which gives anybody listening the geospatial position of that drone in 3D space in the air, and specifically the position of the pilot, is that broadcast something that anybody can pick up on? 
Is it something that's just out there with an application where your cranky neighbor down the street that doesn't like drones at all sees you flying it in the field and can find you and come over and give you a hard time about it? If they limited it just to federal agencies or just the law enforcement agencies or people that had the right to know about that, I'd be totally comfortable with it. But the problem is it's so ill-defined at this point, and they even talk about having applications that can pick this up on a cell phone. That, to me, is scary. That seems to be an invasion of privacy. I should be able to fly. If I'm doing something wrong, come talk to me. But if I'm not, leave me alone. And I don't want every neighbor out there getting an application coming over and asking me about that drone. It's just going to be too invasive to my privacy and my ability to fly. So what they've done in this proposal is identified three categories of flight and the type of drone and the type of broadcast and information that has to be sent uh, based on those categories. And you're going to find that these are incredibly restrictive. And not only are they restrictive, but they're burdensome, they're expensive, it's going to take a major change in the technology to implement them. Now again, maybe some of the manufacturers have seen this coming and they've built in ways to modify the gear you've already got. But I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, boy, this is a major change in the way the equipment's being built. And if future generations in the next two to three years have to include it, you can guarantee the price is gonna go up. So it's gonna make the hobby even more expensive. I'll get into some conclusions at the end where I talk about other methods that you can do the same thing that wouldn't cost them anything. But for now, let me define the categories and then I'll come back and give you some conclusions about what I think you can do as a flyer to really let your voice be heard because this is such a major change in this hobby that if you don't speak up now and this proposal turns into law, it's going to change everything about the way we fly. So let me get into the categories next and I'll come back with some conclusions. The first category of flight is called Standard Remote ID, which is Section 89-110. Any drone in this category will need to be able to broadcast its flight details from the quad for the entire flight. Also required is a connection from the controller to the internet to supply that same flight detail to a remote ID UAS service supplier. Both of these have to be functioning the entire flight or the quad needs to be landed. Also, all current FAA regulations still apply. The second category is called Limited Remote ID, which is Section 89-115 in the proposal, and drones in this category are prohibited from broadcasting their flight details from the quad but they must update those flight details through an internet connection to a remote ID UAS service supplier throughout the entire flight. Drones in this category are also limited to a 400 foot maximum flight distance and that has to be designed into the quad. The third category covers older drones and amateur built drones and it's section 89-120. In this category, the drones aren't required to broadcast their location or flight details, and they don't require an internet connection to update a remote ID UAS service supplier, but they must fly in an FAA-approved field. It should be pretty obvious by now just how these proposed changes are gonna impact you as a flyer, and it's really important that you react to this because right now these are proposed changes, nothing's been implemented, but the FAA has opened up the comment period to give them feedback and your thoughts and your opinions on these proposed changes for the next 30 days. So I have a link below where you can click that link, go right to their website, and fill out that form and let them know what you're thinking. Let them know you've been a flyer for a while, how much you enjoy the hobby, how much you love the beauty the country has to offer from putting a quad up at 100 feet and looking down at that beautiful lake or forest and just give them your feedback because I promise you they listen and I think there's millions of flyers that have drones up in the air so if only a small portion of us got on the website gave more feedback and let them know we're not opposed to the remote ID we think there are better ways of doing it I think they'll definitely listen and it may have an impact on how this rule is finally implemented having said that a couple other things to keep in mind nothing changes immediately so there's a three-year grace period for all of us to come up to speed on this. There's a two year grace period for the manufacturers to modify the hardware if needed to comply with this particular change. So we've got a little bit of time on this and even after the comment period closes, there are ways you can have an impact on this. Now, as I mentioned at the top of this, I've got four or five other clips I'm working on. One of those clips specifically identifies the people in your state, in your community that are on the committees that have recommended changes. So if you've got a senator, congressman, or somebody, an elected official in your environment that you can contact, the best way to do that's in person. The next best way to do that's to sit down and write a handwritten letter to them and let them know exactly what your opinions are because they listen to their constituents and if enough people in a state get to the right person in that state and they're on the committee, that'll have an impact on it as well. A couple of things to keep in mind. The FAA didn't develop these rules out of thin air. They actually put a committee together. It was called ARC, which was the Aviation Rulemaking Committee, and that was a body of 74 different professionals. They were from drone manufacturers, from law enforcement, from local, state, and county governments, um, different technology. I think NASA was on there, but there were 74 people that worked really hard over the summer 
to put together recommendations to sort of come to some consensus of sanity around what the recommendations for remote ID should be. They submitted that to the FAA, and this final proposal deviates tremendously from those ARC recommendations. Now, I've got another clip I'm working on that goes through those ARC recommendations and explains exactly how their common sense approach would be implemented. And I would suggest that if you leave your comments, number one, be, be nice, <laughs> don't, don't, don't curse in there, but be rational about it, but be passionate about it. And I would suggest if you're gonna recommend anything that the FAA seriously look at what the ARC recommendations were, because I think that's closer to what all of us would be comfortable with for this remote idea schema. The other thought I had was, there are so many other ways to implement this. I don't know why you're gonna put the burden on the hobbyist to be the bad guy in the sky that we've gotta track all the time. It would be very easy, because there are technologies out today that could be implemented at the locations that need to be protected that would identify drones that were flying in the area. Just one of those is the product from DJI, the Aeroscale product that can identify a drone up to 17 miles away and know what the drone ID is and what the serial number is and even where the pilot is standing. So there's a lot of technologies on the market today that could do this pretty easily without being so intrusive and burdensome and expensive for the flying public. So I'm hoping that they change their mind. I'm gonna be commenting a lot. I think you can go back a couple of times and do it. So definitely do that, but stay tuned to the channel because I'll have other clips explaining other ways you can have an impact on this and maybe explain it a little bit deeper on the different aspects that they're trying to change because as you guys know, I love this hobby. There's nothing better for me than get up on a Saturday morning with a drone that's fully charged, go out and explore some beautiful area of the country I haven't seen before. And I wanna to continue to do that. And this new ruling that they're putting together, these regulations and what they're trying to change is gonna dramatically affect my ability to do that and not feel that I'm constantly under a microscope. So hopefully you guys feel the same. If you have any questions about anything I've covered, please drop those in the comments below. I'm sorry if I rambled a little bit. I had a lot of editorial commentary in this as well because it's hard for me to be an you know, impartial judge in this because I'm part of it, right? I, I fly like you guys do and I get frustrated when things like this get changed this dramatically in such a short period of time. And I, I'm on both sides of it because I understand the need for remote ID. I just think this is way too intrusive, expensive, burdensome. And I really feel like it's an overreach because if you look at any other aspect of our lives, and a good example I'll use is you've got a car. What if tomorrow the government decided that they wanted to put a tracking device in your car, that when you left your house, they would keep a record of every place you drove and how long you spent there. And it would be kept on some server someplace for an indeterminate period of time that anybody could look at from law enforcement. There was no way any of us would put up with that. So why is it that way with drones? It makes no sense to me whatsoever. So anyway, I'm rambling a little bit. Thank you so much for watching. I'm sorry I had to bring the bad news to you, but I'm really fired up about this and I hope you guys are as well. So. Click the link below, go to the website, make sure you make your comments heard. And again, stay tuned to this channel. I'll have a lot more content about this topic and a whole lot of other fun stuff that I like to talk about around technology. So thanks an awful lot for watching. And until next time, happy flying. Mm -hmm.